You look pretty sleepy there, Sarah. You look pretty sleepy there, Sarah. Wakey, wakey. Yeah, I got like two hours. Allie, how are you? Good. Julian, how are you this morning? Freaking tired. What, not getting enough sleep? No, my sleep schedule's jacked up. Yeah, I know the feeling. Heaven, I would say of everybody I'm looking at right now, you look the most awake and alive. And I can't, I have you unmuted, but I can't hear you. There, now try. I've been up since nine. So I'm awake. Good. Had a good breakfast or? I had toast and jam. Sounds good. It was very good. All right, what time do we got here? It is 10.02, so I'm gonna go ahead and uh, get started this morning with this. So yesterday we had spent some time talking about arousal theory and motivation in sports, particularly. I mean, this is motivation is really, like I said yesterday, kind of the science behind sports psychology, which is a subfield of psychology. So we talked about instinct, drive, and arousal theory as possible theories of how people are motivated yesterday. And so far our discussion has sounded very biological because we've talked about hormones and things like that. And certainly we do have internal drives that push us to do certain things, but external incentives, uh, such as the promise of a promotion, uh, the ability to start in a game or something like that, if we meet certain sales goals at work, can also motivate us. In other words, there are two broad kinds of motivators that we're talking about. There's intrinsic motivation that comes from within us, whereas extrinsic motivators, such as the promise of a promotion, uh, the promise of a starting position, if we perform well, are dependent on external factors. So you probably know what hunger is. Uh, I mean, you've probably been hungry before, probably that 5A or 5, uh, you know, or fourth hour class that you're sitting in, uh, you're sitting, your stomach's rumbling, you're ready to go get something to eat for lunch. And that's something most of us have felt. Uh, it doesn't feel that great, but you might, might not have really thought about in terms of a psychology context, what that means. And probably one of the greatest examples of this, that Snickers commercial where people are hangry, uh, if you recall that, the people are hungry for a Snickers bar, uh, you know, and that changes their whole psychology, their whole demeanor. And, uh, you know, we're gonna talk a little bit about how that's related in the sense that hunger is a motivator. It's something that makes us do things. As a matter of fact, hunger is probably one of the prime motivators in human history. And it's fascinating. Uh, you know, one of the things I love reading about, even though it's kind of scary, uh, is hunger. Because you think we're in a bad, like, post-apocalyptic world now with the coronavirus. I have read histories of people like the Irish famine. Uh, people were digging up the dead to boil their whatever was left of them to eat. They were that hungry. They were boiling their shoes because their shoes were made of leather. Uh, and leather comes from cows. So, I mean, this is, you know, it's horrible what hunger can make you do over a period of time in certain situations. 
Uh, and so it's a huge motivator for people to do really bizarre things. And I think the closest we will ever get to that zombie post-apocalyptic world you see on TV and shows like The Walking Dead uh, is mass starvation. So be glad the stores are open. We're able to get there and get food right now because this is nowhere near as bad as some historical quarantines or when people have been trapped in somewhere. If you don't believe me, read about Sherman's March to the Sea and the Siege of Atlanta. Uh, because the people in Atlanta are exactly what I'm describing right now. They were starving to death and they were willing to do anything, including eat the dead and resort to cannibalism. And really, if you think about it, it's pretty clear why hunger is a motivator in that context. If you think about the last time you were hungry, maybe you were sitting in class and your stomach was growling distractingly and you can't really concentrate. Your classmates are all talking. It's going in one ear and out the other because you're hungry and all you can think about is the burger you're going to just destroy when you get out of that class. What hunger is making you do is, it's making you not pay that much attention in class. And it's also making you have a real drive to satisfy the hunger by eating. Hunger makes you eat. It's a force that makes you do something. And it's up there with sex is one of the things that's really one of our most powerful motivators in human behavior. Hunger and sex together, they determine a lot of how we budget our time and how we think about things. Going out to eat, making plans, going to the grocery store, cooking, this all centers around hunger. Hunger has a big impact on our daily life. And the main reason why is that hunger feels bad. No, we don't like sitting there being hungry. All we're focused on is how our stomach feels instead of anything else. It's pretty universally regarded as something that is not a good thing to be hungry. So we try to make it stop by eating because unlike some kind of vaguer emotional needs, hunger's got a pretty clear solution. If I want to be loved, that has all kinds of vagaries and everything and connotations in the word. But hunger, pretty clear cut. I'm hungry, I'm going to eat. Uh, you eat, the hunger goes away. But something that's a little more interesting to think about is why we feel hungry when we do. Uh, and you might think of it, it's a pretty basic thing. You have your stomach and when it's full, you don't feel hungry and when it's empty or when it has very little food left in, then you feel hunger. And that's kind of how most people do think about it. We just assume that this is true, but actually has that not that much to do. It has something to do with how much food is in your stomach, but it has a lot to do with a lot of other things as well. Because if you think about it, you've probably been in this state. Maybe after that meeting, you did run out. You got your burger. You destroyed it. It was delicious. You got extra fries. You're totally full. You've had your daily caloric intake in that one meal. You come back and someone has brought donuts. You turn down the donut. Most people aren't, aren't going to, uh, even though they're full, they're going to participate in having the donuts. So you see the tasty donut and you find room for at least maybe half a donut. So part of our hunger and eating needs are tied up a lot in socialization, uh, social cues, social clues and everything. I remember my oldest son, it was about three o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, they'd had lunch about noon and my grandmother took them to, for you know just like a quick snack at Monocle's Pizza. And him and his cousins ended up ordering like another whole meal. Uh, and my grandmother was shocked because these are like eight and nine year old boys. Uh, and she's like, you know, how can you eat this much? Goes, my son told her, this is just a hearty in between uh, because he's already asking what's for dinner later. And I'm pretty sure he's full. He's had plenty of food, but social custom dictates six o'clock's dinner. So you're taking us out now. This is just a hearty snack. And then at six o'clock, because that's the time we always have dinner, we will have dinner. Alzheimer's patients uh, it, who have you know, lost memory capabilities, particularly short-term memory, you will feed them lunch. And if you tell them, okay, it's noon, it's lunchtime, they will eat another lunch. Uh, it's fascinating you know, how the brain works in that regard. So there's no possible way after that monstrous burger, you really have more caloric need, but you do find room to eat donuts anyway. So it's clearly not just, do I need food? And is my stomach full? But there are some other physical factors that affect it, and one of them is the hypothalamus. What the hypothalamus's involvement as hunger basically is, is that it has two main parts. There's one part that controls or influences when you want to start eating, and there's another that influences when you want to stop eating. And this is pretty interesting. They actually find that in lab rats, if this part of the hypothalamus, the start eating part, is damaged, the rat 
even if it's presented with something tasty, and I don't know what rats find tasty, but let's imagine it's you, uh, you know, you're presented with this delicious burger, you would just not eat it because your hypothalamus is not engaged in regulating whether you want to start eating or not. And the stop eating part of it, again, in the lab rats, if it's damaged, the rats will just eat and eat and eat until they're horribly obese. They have no concept of when to stop because their body's not able to tell them effectively, okay, now it is time to stop eating. And that's what would happen if the part of your hypothalamus that makes you stop eating were damaged. And it's pretty cool that these are just random parts of your brain that really have a direct effect on whether you eat. Uh, before I go on you know, to, to other things, uh, biological things that regulate your eating, uh, let me just say there is a little thing on the bottom of your screen, I believe, that, that says raise your hand. And I'm looking at your video things here. If I see the little icon of a hand up there, I'll know that you want to raise your hand and I will unmute you. However, you also have the ability to unmute yourself if you want to say something. I've just muted everybody right now just so I don't have a lot of background noise while I'm doing this and we're not all talking over each other. Good to go? All right. So there's also hormones that affect whether you want to eat or not. And one of them is insulin. And that's something that might be familiar to you if you think about people who are diabetic. I will say this, Cullum was nine years old when he was diagnosed uh, with diabetes. And for almost four months prior to that, he was eating nonstop. I mean, he eats a lot now. But I'm telling you, he'll eat maybe two or three of those hungry man boneless fried chicken dinners, one of his favorites, and be full. He was nine years old and he would eat four, five of these things and still be hungry. I was seriously worried about my food budget because we were spending hundreds of dollars feeding this kid. And why? Because the insulin hormone wasn't being released anymore to tell him, okay, we have enough energy, we're full up. It was like his body was just like, okay, we got to keep eating. And one of the things diabetics suffer from is eye problems and foot problems because the body will start eating itself because it has no way of knowing that there's food in there to get energy from. And so uh, the things that are further away from the blood supply are the first consumed, and that's the eyes and your feet. And that's why they have those types of problems. So insulin is the hormone that regulates blood sugar. And if you eat something that's going to affect your blood sugar because the body processes it and dumps sugar into your bloodstream, and so the insulin interacts with that and can then tell your brain how you're doing on blood sugar levels. Your brain can keep track of that. And there's other hormones that your stomach secretes as well. One of these is called frelin, that's uh, with a GH. And this is, again, just another signal to your brain that I've eaten or I haven't eaten. And your brain has lots of ways of keeping track of this. There's a lot more hormones, but you get the general idea is that they communicate to your brain sort of how you're doing on nutrition and when you've eaten last. So I've gone over some of the physical factors besides is there food in your belly that affect hunger. But what are also kind of interesting is the psychological factors, because there are some that really have nothing to do with anything going on in your body and are just things that are going on in your brain. And one of these that's really interesting is that in studies of patients with memory loss, and I kind of already alluded to this, uh, so maybe people with severe Alzheimer's or with some sort of amnesia, what researchers have found is that if they come in and they say, do you want this delicious lunch? The patients will be like, oh, yeah, it's lunchtime. I want that. And so they eat. It's gone. Half an hour later, this seems a little mean to me, the researchers will come back and they'll say, hey, do you want some lunch? And people with memory loss will be like, eh, sure, all right, it's lunchtime. And anyway, it goes again into their bellies. Some of them will even eat three lunches. And they found that they would eat on average between two to three lunches because they just couldn't remember that they'd eaten lunch already. And even as they were asked to rate their hunger levels, they would rate their hunger levels as actually a bit lower after they've eaten two to three lunches, understandably. But they would still eat because they thought it was lunchtime. The, so, the whole social, cultural uh, you know, meaning of lunch, that it's lunchtime, I eat lunch. So a really important regulator in how we approach food is that it doesn't always have to do with our need to eat nutritionally, calorically, things like that, but just has to do with whether we feel like it's lunchtime. And this obviously comes up in the case with the people with memory loss. But even if you think about yourself, if you eat this giant burger and the fries and maybe those donuts that were at school, you come home and it's dinner time and you probably don't really need any more calories for the day, what do you do? Well, the expectation for social reasons is you'll sit down with the family and have dinner because it's dinner time. And I'm always reminded of, if you, I'm a big fan of J.R.R. Tolkien and I've seen all the movies, 
uh, the Lord of the Rings trilogy, the Fellowship of the Ring. They're first going out on that march and the hobbits like mid afternoon stop and they're going to make dinner. And, uh, you know, uh, the, the ranger guy uh, is asking them, you know, what are you doing? Well, it's, it's uh, you know, I'm afraid they have a whole, they have a whole thing. There's breakfast, there's uh, late breakfast, and they have like seven or eight meals that they're just traditionally, we're going to stop and eat because now it's, you know, uh, post-lunch or whatever they called it now. I can't remember, but if you've seen it, you know what I'm talking about. So you're probably done with your 2,000. You might even be over 2,000 calories by this point, which is the standard daily recommended allowance for a male. But it's dinner time. You'll probably eat anyway because that's what culturally we're programmed to do. So that's one kind of psychological factor, the idea of the involvement of memory and ritual in food. Another big one is cultural attitudes toward eating and also toward weight because eating and weight pretty much get equated, at least in our culture, or you can't really talk about one without talking about the other. So what we find, at least in America, as things have gone on, is that we've been valuing lower and lower weights, uh, so thinner and thinner people, basically, while actually the majority of people in the country are getting more and more overweight. And this is something that really produces a lot of interesting eating patterns uh, for our culture and not maybe normal eating patterns if you go back to, say, the Neolithic and look at how humans foraged and survived then. And all of that is cultural. Uh, so people end up binging or they end up developing other eating disorders like anorexia or bulimia as a result of their normal human instinctual eating patterns conflicting with cultural desires for weight. Anorexics are people who don't eat enough. Uh, they don't not eat enough because they're hideously overweight and they actually need to lose weight. They don't eat enough because they have an eating disorder and it's not really related to physical need. Matter of fact, there are some anorexics who weigh 98 pounds and you know are 5'10", uh, but they still look in the mirror and see themselves, their perception of themselves is as overweight, and so they choose to continue not to eat, thinking that they'll continue to be overweight in their perception of themselves. But what this reminds us of is how many things go into this affecting how a motivator like hunger is turned into an action. It usually is turned into eating, Sometimes it isn't, or sometimes it's turned into disproportionate eating. So there's one last physical thing that's important for weight, and that's the idea that people don't have always the same caloric needs as each other. And this has to do with your basal metabolic rate. My basal metabolic rate is really low. I can eat a potato chip and I will probably gain 10 pounds because I think genetically my body is still designed for famine for you know, the Irish potato famine that my body thinks, hey bud, at some point we're all gonna starve to death. And the good news is with this whole corona thing, if we're shut down for a long time and we have limited access to food, my body is built for that. So I'm gonna last a lot longer than Ali Compton, for example, no offense, Ali. Uh, but, uh, you know, Cullum, my brother's very high metabolic rate. Cullum can sit down and eat 10 pieces of chicken. He won't gain an ounce. My brothers are the same way. Those are the people who are gonna get uh, you know, they're going to die off first and leave us fatties behind uh, so that we can uh, survive and carry on the human race here. But the basal metabolic rate is basically how many calories you burn while you're sitting on the couch. So some people can just sit on the couch and they don't burn very many calories. Their bodies are really efficient. Uh, they can eat a bag of chips, doesn't really go anywhere. And these kinds of people would have been great back in the day when there were famines. In fact, for many people whose ancestors experienced famines, such as the Irish famine, there's a great deal of evidence that it actually altered their descendants' DNA to be more ready for the environmental occurrence by slowing their metabolic rate. And I'll, I'll raise my hand right here because I think I'm one of those people. Uh, these are the people you would want to be friends with when the next big famine comes, just so you know. Uh, but some people, the ones I hate personally, will do the same activity. They'll sit on the couch, they'll eat a bag of chips, and that bag of chips will be burned up because their basal metabolic rate is way higher. When I was a kid, I'm much, always been much broader than my brothers, uh, and but and I'm the oldest too. And so, really, the only thing my brothers ever had on me was they would call me fat. So I apologize if I get a little touchy about this basal metabolic rate. But that's the only thing they ever had on me, and I'm kind of competitive with my brothers being the oldest. So this is something that can really have an effect on weight and hunger and how we interact with food. And it's a really interesting puzzle between hunger and eating and weight. These are things that seem like they should be pretty straightforward. They should have pretty reliable causational things between them. 
You eat too much, you gain weight. But they actually don't because there are so many different factors that are involved. And so you can't look at someone who's overweight and necessarily say with certainty, you just eat too much. Now, hopefully I've gone over a few of these things and you get a little bit of a better sense of how complicated a picture this actually is and how interesting it is. I've spent a great deal of time in my historical studies, I mentioned earlier, personally studying the subject and the behaviors that hunger, particularly starvation, motivates people to engage in are awe-inspiring and terrifying. Like I said, mass starvation is the closest I think we will ever get to the zombie apocalypse. And if you think about it, the zombie apocalypse is a matter of mass starvation because what are those zombies wanting to walk around and do? Eat you, they're starving to death. So a population of truly starving people is about the closest we may get to a zombie apocalypse. Now we talk about hunger as this big motivator, uh, but what else motivates it, us? I mean, have you thought about what motivates you uh, in your athletic endeavors, in your academic endeavors, as you plan and prepare for college. As you're here today on this, what motivated you to get up early in the morning when you had no reason to basically uh, and be here today for this class? Why do we get up and go to work or school? Why do we hang out with our friends? Why do schools provide recess or employers provide paid vacation days? And the answers to these questions can be found within the study of motivation and more specifically what we call needs. Some psychologists say motivation is driven by unsatisfied needs, that we do things because we have a need that still needs to be met. And I don't mean to be uh, rhetorical there, need that needs to be, but you get the idea. Uh, so, so needs like food, shelter, happiness, recognition, and understanding which needs are crucial and how these needs affect people's behavior is important to know if you want to motivate people to do things in life. And I'm not talking about motivating them, you know, taking power <laughs> like that or anything like that. I'm talking about motivating them to be better people in some cases, uh, motivating them to drop bad habits. So teachers, leaders, businesses, coaches, everyone needs to be aware of needs. And there was a guy, one of the founders of humanistic psychology, if you remember, uh, along with Carl Rogers named Abraham Maslow. And Maslow was really focused on studying human needs and how to organize these needs and to understand them. So in the 1950s, uh, he developed a theory called the hierarchy of needs. And Maslow is one of the founders, like I said, of humanistic psychology, which emphasizes the individual's potential and stresses the importance of growth and self-actualization. Maslow's theory grew out of his interest in developing a psychology that was not based in clinical studies, but rather focused on normal human growth and development. And Maslow developed a list that classified all needs into five general groups. And most importantly, he asserted that there was a hierarchy of these five groups of needs in terms of their importance for human development. The higher needs at the top of the hierarchy were most important for the development of personality. However, these higher needs couldn't be satisfied until you satisfy the lower needs. So the higher needs are, are what he kind of called self-actualization. And self-actualization is improving your education to become a better person, uh, you know, working on better habits. But if you're starving to death, uh, you really don't have time to focus on that other stuff. So hunger is something that's on the bottom of this pyramid of needs, this hierarchy of needs. Uh, so they can't, the higher needs cannot be satisfied until the lower needs or deficiency needs, such as the physiological needs and safety needs were satisfied. And if two different needs were in conflict, the lower need would dominate. Uh, and this is why schools provide, you know, free lunches, uh, you know, breakfast to kids uh, free, because they can't really be educated and learn if they're sitting in class all day thinking about how hungry they are that lower need needs to be satisfied before they can work on that higher need of increasing their knowledge. So that's all I had for today. Uh, I'm gonna stop sharing the screen here with you and we will unmute everybody. Any questions from you guys? Everybody doing okay? Allie's yeah. Out. Allie's out sleeping with a moose. Or is that a yeah. That's Jill. 
Sarah, I didn't see you earlier. Are you in your car or something? Yeah. I'm in where, where are you going? <laughs> we had a doctor's appointment. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I came in a couple minutes late. That's why. I was in the middle of talking, so I didn't notice. Yeah. It was only like three minutes, though. So. Are you doing a Corona and Spanish flu one tonight? Uh, hopefully. I couldn't do it last night. I ran into a little bit of a technical issue. So, And like any class, it takes time to prepare. So this, mm -hmm. Ooh, it'd be cool to talk about this, and I want to get it done as quickly as possible because I want to do it while it's re relevant, but it does take time to prepare. So it might be a bit touch and go. Okay. But I, I, I'm starting off with the history of the Spanish flu, so hopefully I'll be able to talk about some of that tonight. Yeah, okay. So what time is that? 7 o'clock. Okay. Seven o'clock to seven thirty. They only give me a half hour on these, so. Yeah. Any other questions? You guys doing okay? Got everything you need for this? Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, it's good seeing you, and hopefully we'll see you tomorrow. I'm gonna go ahead and end this meeting. Have a good day. And so. Bye. Oh, and the economics meeting is coming up next, so if you want to join in. Got it. Yeah.